brush handling is a lot about learning how to loosen your grip. And I think for a lot of painting, um, loosening the grip becomes much more important than how much control you have. I'm celebrating World Watercolor Month with a new video every day in July. Uh, today what I wanted to talk about was brush handling. Uh, just very briefly, I want to tell you how I kill my brushes, um, how I put them through their paces, and uh, show you some of the, the different things that you can be thinking about um, when it comes to holding your brush, making it do what you want it to do, or working alongside of it. Uh, just before we get started, uh, I wanted to mention World Watercolor Month. It's an absolutely fabulous time of celebrating this beautiful medium, and it is open to everyone to participate. There are no rules, really. Uh, you get to just show up and paint when you paint. If you're posting your work on social media, I hope you'll share it with the hashtag World Watercolor Month so that we can see what you're making. Uh, also, there is a World Watercolor Month video challenge uh, where various YouTubers and watercolor lovers are posting videos uh, featuring some of the things we're painting through World Watercolor Month. And you can check that out by using the hashtag World Watercolor Month video challenge in the YouTube search bar or uh, click the link below in, in the description below the video. But before you do that, let's dive into brush handling. How do you make your brush make the beautiful marks that the famous or skilled or just the other people are making? Um, maybe you don't feel like your marks are doing what you want them to do. I'm just trying to find a piece of paper so we can play here. Um, maybe you feel like uh, you're only painting the same marks and you're tired of them. Uh, maybe you feel like your marks are stiff and rigid. Uh, these are all problems that I have had, and uh, we're going to get through it together. Let's just call it a little bit of uh, watercolor mark making therapy today. And um, with that in mind, I'm actually pulling out a painting that I started working on um, last week, I think. And um, might be too big to fit on the screen here, so I might have to make a little bit of adjustments. Um, first of all, look at all that fabulous color. Fabulous blues, turquoises, pinks, um, yellow, violet. We're getting just into the color here. And um, I've also used, how? I had a sharp tool in my um, pencil container and uh, managed to just gouge my, my finger here. I don't need stitches, it's just a scratch, flush wound. Oh, and I'm determined it's not gonna stop me. So I had some really beautiful marks that I, I've already been making on this paper and some kind of unstudied marks and that's kind of a little bit of a favorite thing for me. Um, I have these Daniel Smith watercolor sticks so I can draw on my paper as though I'm using crayons which has been really really fun. You know I've, I've done a lot of fun little mark making. Um, this painting is at a stage where you know we want to go a little bit further maybe. So I'm going to pull out some of my favorite hues from Daniel Smith today, uh, and a little bit from Sennelier. This is a, what did they call it? Turquoise green. We're gonna work with a little bit of cobalt blue. That's Daniel Smith. We are gonna pull out the opera pink. I haven't used it in a couple days and it's looking a little chunky. And then I think that yellow is the benzamidazolone yellow. So that's here as well. So these are my hues so far, and they can mix together to really, I mean, they're basically primary colors, so we can work with them as though they were primary colors and trust that they're gonna make a whole bunch of beautiful results for us today. But first I wanna talk about mark making. And I wanna do it in context of this painting because this really is a painting that lets me feel free to kinda of go a little nuts with my mark making and I want to be able to do that. And the first thing I would say is when you're working on a larger painting like this, the goal is to try not to work too small. Your brush needs to be larger. Um, this is a number 10 round, and it's not gonna make a big, bold mark. Anything it does on this paper is going to seem a little bit diminutive, and we can't have diminutive if we want, you know, vibrant bold strokes. So we need to be willing to size up the brush brush in accordance with how big our painting is. Um, so I have two slightly larger brushes here. This is a number 10 rigger from a Skoda. And so it's 
got the same diameter as the number 10 from Rosemary, but it's got longer bristles, which means I can make a broader mark with the side of the brush. I also have a number four quill, and um, so the numbers are all over the place, but you can see that it's fatter, um, it's plumper. We're gonna get a squishier, a wetter stroke. It's gonna hold more water. So that's gonna give me a different mark as well um, and the ability to make some big bold marks. Another brush I like for making wide strokes is my Cheap Joe's Dagger Striper. And this is actually the smallest dagger striper they make. Uh, but the number one, um, even though it's a very fine point and can make very thin lines, it also can make a really wide stroke because the bristles are so long. So um, th those are some options that I have. Um, thinking about brush handling uh, as well, I might want to work with a wide brush. Um, it's obviously going to make a wide stroke and um, you know comparison wise we are getting a similar length of bristle very close to the quill um, it's going to be a little bit snappier because it is shorter and um, and it's of course going to make a, a wider more rectangular stroke um, this brush from Levinson paint brushes this is a handmade watercolor brush um, always works better to get it wet so you can get a feel for its shape and in comparison to my number 10 rigger you can see we've got a lot of length and a plumper body as well um, this escota is a little bit used I've worn it used it for a while so it's not as fine a point as it used to be but um, just with this I get a much more unpredictable stroke because of how long it is and so um, the one thing about the brush once you start to get into brushes this size is it takes a little work um, if you want to get into your pigment wells with a bigger brush sometimes you need bigger pigment wells as well uh, because the opera pink is quite firm in my palette i might have to work at it for a while to loosen up enough pigment to give me the bold stroke i want that's another thing to think about and uh, the drier the brush the shorter the brush stroke it's going to make so you want to think about how much moisture is on your brush as well. So there's a lot of factors that go into just choosing, even just to make one bold brush stroke, um, you know, you might have to um, work at it for a while. So let's just see. See, um, I, I felt like it wasn't as big a stroke as I wanted. It wasn't as juicy as I wanted. So I'm having to work back and forth a little bit just to get one movement um, mark uh, mark of movement into my painting. I'm going to bring in a little bit of cobalt blue. We're going to um, kind of double, t double team this stroke here. So I've got the cobalt blue on my brush now. Um, I didn't clean the brush, so I've got a little opera pink on it as well. Um, and I'm just going to work with uh, holding my brush high on the brush. That's the other thing to think about for brush handling is if I want a loose mark, a relaxed looking mark I need to let go of control and working like this with um, a loose grip and not a lot of preciousness to how I hold the brush and how I move the brush uh, that's going to give me the freedom to make some marks that are just a little bigger and bolder let's bring some of that yellow back um, brush handling sometimes means not being in charge at all. Um, just dropping um, those spatters of the benzamidazolone actually is really pretty. How does this color layer over the colors that are already on the paper? Um, with working with some primary-esque vibrant colors that we're using right now that means um, they are mixing colors they do mix well together um, we might get some murkiness in some areas and that's a good thing um, if everything's vibrant we start to um, it, it becomes very hard to differentiate um, what's important what's not important where's the quiet space for my eye to rest I love the way this brush kind of splays out. Um, I am linking to this uh, to the 
um, this brush on the Levinson website in the description below the video. I'd encourage you to check it out. They are handmade. There's some a really beautiful story in the process behind making these brushes and um, just the um, I, I, I well I can't even go there and paint at the same time too many things to think about um, just they're beautifully made um, they're very intuitive uh, I love working with something that another artist has had, had a hand in for me brush handling um, and let's get to the heart of it here Brush handling is a lot about learning how to loosen your grip. And I think for a lot of painting, um, loosening the grip becomes much more important than how much control you have. Because control can only get you so far. It can only take you as far as the limits of your imagination. And so often that means you're pushed into a commitment, still holding higher on the brush, into a commitment to what your original plan was without ever stopping to think about what what the painting might be offering you in terms of other options. So I really um, like to have this push to let go um, so that the painting can take its own stride. Um, I can develop strategies around using different tools and I can develop in an environment of trust and that's kind of the heart of it. There's a little pop of yellow there that's really kind of pretty. It makes me think I need to bring more yellow into my painting. Uh, this brush creates those broad strokes. Uh, let's see if we can't um, with yellow, if I'm bringing yellow into my painting, I'm actually, I still am covering, so I'm subtracting light, even though it's yellow and vibrant. My lightest parts of my painting are still going to be the areas with the least amount of paint on them most of the time. Um, the most transparent areas. Um, with this brush, sometimes I'll get just a really nice broad comb-like mark with some little lines in it and um, I really like that um, let's contrast it with the, um, the, the marks that the quill brush will make as well um, I, f I don't love using quill brushes I kind of struggle with them because I feel like the marks can be very simplistic you can just get kind of fat and thin lines and I like squishy marks I like the the four lines that this Levinson brush made as the hairs split apart I don't get any of that with the mop brush it's much um, less willing to do interesting things in my opinion and so but I, I've also learned that sometimes those unstudied marks can be really pretty too and it's just in being willing to kind of let them look a little amateurish and that actually has been a really fun part of my process is learning that I can create kind of unstudied amateurish looking marks um, cobalt blue and still have painting that's interesting and pleasing. When I want to control my brush, I'm going to clamp down, down low like this. But most of the time in my paintings, I don't want that kind of control. Um, the most interesting marks happen the higher I hold my brush. The more willing I am to let it kind of, let the wind kind of take it. <laughs> let it be intuitively um, dancing across my page. And um, from there, uh, I've found that there's a beauty in my own voice. A couple things about um, brush handling as well is this is something to pay attention to. If my goal is looseness in painting, then I need to pay attention to what my hand is doing on the handle of my brush because 
I can tell myself to take a break when I see my hand choking up on the brush. Um, my body language is probably also tense and I need to walk away or shake it out, do something where I can find my freedom again. And sometimes that means I'm obliterating a mark. Um, this mark here I don't love. And learning how to let go of something I've placed on the paper. That can be really exciting. Yeah, that's just releasing it. I didn't even have to touch it with my brush. Um, but I released those surface pigments. They float off the page. Little tendrils of pigment are left behind. And that creates something very pleasing as well. And so I'm learning to listen to my body language. I'm learning to pay attention to what my hand does on the paper. Um, and it's in those passages that um, I start to develop a language, uh, a brush handling language that's partially me, but there's a lot of um, just letting the brush do what it was made to do. Uh, we haven't used the, the dagger striper yet. You'll see it in my other videos. Um, it's one thing with doing a, a fresh video every day um, is that you'll see a lot of my favorite products over and over again. Uh, something I like to do, and you can look for it in my paintings, is I like to sometimes create rhythmic marks where I'm maybe painting lines across the page or even little grids. And um, sometimes I'll drag paint around the page um, with my lines. Sometimes uh, it's just very subtle. But it makes me, it gives me a secret little happy feeling when I paint some of these um, rhythmic lines that um, maybe feel a little bit structured. And I'll do them even in a painting that's supposed to have a lot of um, nature and um, just haphazard trees in it and I'll be um, somewhere in the painting I'll have hidden a little um, lo just line up of lines so that's a lot of fun and it reminds me I think that sometimes the marks that feel the most ugly and raw end up being the best things about your painting and so um, you don't want to just uh, criticize a mark that you've placed. Um, something I, I really enjoy doing is just looking at my most ugly marks, the ones I really don't like, um, looking at them with a little bit of curiosity and a uh, sense of possibility. What could I do beyond just trying to erase that mark? What could I do to make it better? Um, more interesting, more fun, um, or just let it live and just learn how to enjoy it. How could I do that? And um, when I when I look for those opportunities to just love what I've already done rather than trying to fix it, for me that seems like that's the key um, to kind of finding some freedom and trust in my process. I like the yellow over here. I just felt like it needed more on this, something on the, that side to kind of bring them together. Maybe even a little bit down there. And um, the other thing that you should do is this particular painting, I chose it because it's kind of a no rules painting. And so I knew that I could get away with throwing a lot of marks and lines on it um, without really worrying about how it was gonna turn out. I really kind of like it. Um, yeah, I don't know what I like about it. I don't aside from the colors and the energy, but uh, whether you know, I it gets to be just an experimental Angela's being brave painting, and um, that's its first priority. And uh, paintings like that are not wasted for me. They're really essential to helping me develop as an artist, um, becoming braver in my practice. Let's put some measles over here. Uh, with those unstudied ugly marks of the mop brush that I usually don't care for. Quill brush, mop brush, whatever. Um, suddenly we have more of the unstudied marks. Um, 
I like that. It's kind of a little bit of a rebellion uh, against my own taste and the things I tell myself that I shouldn't do and don't like. I need space for that. And um, when you're working on having a freer brush handling uh, process, a freer brush handling uh, ability or strategy, this is where you want to do it. Freedom. Um, just absolutely challenging yourself. You say I can't do that, and here you're telling yourself that. Um, I'm going to do it anyhow. And that has been super, super fun for me. So um, as you think about uh, having fun with mark making, you literally have to have fun with it. Break the rules, uh, create a piece of paper where anything goes, um, and layer mark after mark after mark, and then break up those marks with flow, add some water, pay attention to how you're holding your brush and where your hand is placed on the brush. Um, think about practice moving from your whole arm or loosening your wrist <laughs> and, uh, you know, try using a non-dominant hand if you're really struggling with rigidity and uh, just have some fun with this. It is the freedom we allow ourselves that really translates into some of our best and most inspired work. Uh, you're capable of more than you think and there's more beauty in your art than just what is found by following the rules and having all the control. And I just want to encourage you with that. Uh, there is a link in the description below, a bunch of links linking to the brushes I've used today. So take a look at that and um, let me know. <laughs> let me know which is your favorite. What's what what are you having fun playing with? Uh, I'd love to hear about it down in the comments. Uh, as always, there are links to World Watercolor Month uh, festivities and uh, the video challenge, uh, the different video events. I am posting here every single day in July and uh, I hope you're enjoying this series. I'm sure enjoying making it. Thanks so much. Thanks for watching. I'll be back tomorrow with more watercolor advice you can learn from. Don't forget to include the hashtag World Watercolor Month when you participate and post watercolor art in July.